Let's jump right in and we'll work through this material. And the very first thing that I want to say is that courageous leaders know how to change their number. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And author John Mark Comer wrote a book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And in that book, he wonders, why does the truth of Jesus seem to get way more attention than the way of Jesus? What was the way of Jesus? Well, we know it was uh, uh, an unhurried pace of ministry. Uh, Jesus never seemed rushed at all. And, and uh, to sort of summarize that point, I will simply say this, Jesus had 36 months to change the world. And are you ready for this? He never ran anywhere, <laughs> right? We never read in scripture, Jesus woke up in the morning and already felt like he was overwhelmed and stressed and running behind. So he quickly gathered the disciples together and began to sprint toward Capernaum, right? We never read that in scripture because it never happened. John Mark Comer says this, to walk with Jesus is to walk with a slow, unhurried pace. Hurry is the death of prayer and only impedes and spoils our work. It never advances it. It never advances it. Somebody say, ouch to that. And so the answer to, to this problem that we oftentimes face in ministry of having a crazy pace is for us to change our number. And I just want to talk to you really logistically about this concept for just a couple of minutes. So the, the main reason that we sometimes find ourselves going Mach 5 with our hair on fire, so to speak, is simply because the number of things that we have to do and accomplish in a single day, that number is too big. That number is too high. And oftentimes, we're the ones that set that really big number. And when we have too many things to accomplish in a day, that creates a hectic lifestyle. And that work style is not sustainable for us as leaders. And listen to this. It's not good for Jesus's work. It's not the way of Jesus. And so the very first thing that I believe we need to do is we need to change that number and, and we need to adjust it down from the, the 15 or 20 things that we're trying to get done each day. And we need to adjust it down to maybe the top three things or on some days, maybe even the main one thing. So, right, if I said to you, what are the, the three things, the, the three main things that you must get done tomorrow in order for tomorrow to be a successful day? What are those? Would you be able to, to name them and would you be able to set them as a priority? Author Tim Ferriss uh, throws a couple challenging questions out uh, at us to uh, uh, help us drill down on this concept. He says this, if you had a heart attack, and could only work two hours a day, what would you do to continue to move your organization forward? What would be those three or four things you would focus on? And then he adds this, if you had a second heart attack and could only work two hours a week, then what would you do? And then how about this? If you had a gun to your head and had to stop doing 80% of the different time-consuming activities that you currently do each and every day, what would you remove from your schedule? And then again, if you said uh, this right here, I must get this one thing accomplished today, 
and I will be satisfied, it will be a successful day, what would that one thing be? Uh, are you able to name that and, and set it as a priority? Now, for some of us, we might even say, you know what, Jonathan, even if I could get that number down from 15 to 20 things and get it down to the top three or four, I, I, think, I'd still, I think I'd still struggle with that because I, I, uh, uh, I get interrupted all the time, or I'm not able to work as, uh, as efficiently as I, as I feel like I need to. And so let's talk for a few minutes about uh, how to work a little bit more efficiently as we continue to, to, to battle our schedules a little bit. So the, the first thing I would say when we're talking about working efficiently is that we need to conquer something called Parkinson's law. And Parkinson's law is this right here. Uh, a task will swell in perceived importance and complexity based on the amount of time we have to complete it. I think we all understand this concept. I, I have a, uh, a doctorate degree and it took me seven years to get my doctorate degree completed. Do you know why? because they kick you out of the program after seven years. So I took the full seven years. And guess what? If they told me that they were gonna kick me out after five years, guess how long it would have taken me to get my doctorate? I would have gotten it done in, in five years, right? So we, we tend to stretch projects and tasks out uh, into the allotted time that we feel like we have to complete them. And, and that can really cause us to work inefficiently. And so one of the things we need to do to battle this is we need to shorten project time to limit tasks and, and force the important. So, so when we have a uh, 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 less time self-imposed to complete a task or complete a project, then oftentimes we dial in our focus, everybody, right? And we get it done. And let's say that time frame is two hours. We get it done in two hours and it turns out great. But if we had four hours to do that project or that task, we would spread it out over four hours, but the end result would still be the same. So we need to think about how to battle this. And, and, and one of the things I would say is we really need to discipline ourselves. Uh, we can set some self-imposed time limits connected with projects and tasks. Maybe we even need to use a timer, <laughs> right? Uh, maybe we need to say, you know what? Uh, I'm going to uh, dedicate the next two hours to, uh, to getting this project or this task done. And at the end of two hours, I am going to hit send on it. I'm not going to spend time tweaking it. Over the next day or two, I'm going to set the timer, I'm going to get it done, and I'm going to push, send, or submit. And, and again, as we do that, it helps us to dial in focus and get stuff done. And I will say this, you ready for this, everybody? Done is better than perfect. And so understand that concept and how that needs to impact our, our schedules uh, day in and day out. So we need to work to conquer Parkinson's law. Next, we should cut back on multitasking or better yet, we should actually eliminate it. And instead of multitasking, we should practice something called batching. Batching is doing the same sort of work together all at once once it reaches a critical mass or when we decide and determine that all of that similar work should be done together. Author Tim Ferriss talks about this concept of batching. And I actually wanna show you a full five minute video here because I think it's really intriguing and it's gonna help you understand the concept of batching further. So check this out.
One of the concepts, one of the strategies that I'm most commonly asked about from the 4-Hour Workweek is batching. There are many, many, many finer points to this. And quite aside from, of course, 80-20, delegating, outsourcing, Parkinson's law, batching comes up again and again and again. So what is batching? To explain it in simplest terms, we can talk about laundry. All right, so you wouldn't do your laundry every time you have a new pair of dirty socks. You wait for a certain critical mass of dirty laundry to accumulate, and then you do the laundry. Why? Same with post office. If you have many different types of mail that are going to come together that you need to mail, you're going to wait for a certain critical mass as opposed to just going there for every single letter because there's a setup cost. There is a task switching cost, getting in the car, driving there, spending the gas, spending the time, laundry, putting it all together, detergent, and so on. Right? So the, the time and labor involved in doing one letter or 20 or one pair of socks or an entire basket of clothing is the same. And you want to be both effective and efficient with your allocation of resources, i.e. time. If you apply those to business, you can apply them in a million and one different ways. And I'll give you a few examples. One of the most common, I suppose, directional questions or specifics that I'm asked about is frequency. Well, do I batch on a daily basis? Do I batch on a weekly basis? Do I batch on a monthly or quarterly basis? And the answer is I do all of those things. But you don't have to try it all at once, and I would not encourage you to do that. I would encourage you to perhaps try one or two approaches and see what works for you. This is a very personal set of techniques. You develop a portfolio that works for yourself. Let me tell you a few things that I and others do. For instance, you might decide that on a given day from the time you wake up until lunch is your primary creation period. This could be writing, it could be recording, it could be anything that is proactively creative and synthesis. Then once you have lunch, you are permitted to do administrative tasks, phone calls, email, triage, calendaring, and so on. I do this quite a lot, uh, particularly from Tuesday to Thursday uh, on, on certain weeks. On a weekly basis, I know the CEO of a very well-known startup, pretty much everyone watching this would know this company, and instead of batching on a daily basis, looking at his week, Monday to Friday, he might have day one, administrative tasks, Day two, HR hiring. Day three, product. Day four, marketing. And on each of those days, he will focus on thematically or categorically those types of tasks. That is yet another approach. And very commonly, I will batch phone calls on Mondays and Fridays. And, in, and I would say even broadly speaking, this is voice-related tasks. So I will have phone calls and podcast recording on Mondays and Fridays. And this helps to prevent also interruptions and task switching that can result if you have miscellaneous phone calls and podcasts scattered throughout the week. It uh, makes it very difficult to do deep work on anything that might require three to five hours of uninterrupted time. On a, on a quarterly basis, uh, you could look at batch producing or completing certain types of normally scattered activities. For instance, I am recording this video right now during a content generation week, where a week is blocked out once per quarter to focus on answering common questions that all of you or my readers or listeners have asked and so on and so forth. On a, say, six month to yearly basis, I, I have started in the last few years batching travel. Why would I batch travel? I mean, there are many different reasons to batch travel. One of my reasons is that I want to practice being off the grid for extended periods of time to not only remind myself and prove to myself that it is possible to do that, and no, the internet will not stop, the universe will not end if you are unavailable and unreachable for certain periods of time, uh, and also to rejuvenate, to recharge being away from social media and keyboards, and laptops, screens, and so on. Batching is one of the fundamental concepts that you need to understand. If you understand the principle, the reasons for it, the concepts, you can come up with your own examples to experiment with. And these are not permanent changes. Think of them as two-week experiments. One tiny thing that you can test, assuming that it's on a daily or weekly basis, and try it out. See what works. 
I love this concept of batching. And listen, everybody, do you know what the opposite of batching is? It's multitasking. <laughs> it's trying to do everything all at once. And oftentimes that uh, uh, crushes our inefficiency and, and really makes work challenging for us the more we multitask. Tim Ferriss says this, there is a psychological switching of gears that can require up to 45 minutes, listen to this, some key words here, to fully resume a major task that has been interrupted. More than a quarter of each nine to five period is consumed by such interruptions, right? So think about the role of batching and, and what it means to block time for uh, specific project work or activity work. And uh, think about how multitasking, <laughs> trying to do everything all at once, can actually get in the way of our, uh, of our efficiency and can get in the way of us doing excellent work. So connected with this concept of batching, the other thing I wanna say here is we absolutely should think about batching email. We have to figure out how to deal with email. We have to figure out a good system that works for each and every one of us. Tim Ferriss said this, email is the greatest single interruption in the modern world. <laughs> and I completely agree with that. And the deal is this, we need to set up a system so that we choose email and we don't let it choose us. So maybe as an example, part of your system is going to be you're going to deal with email for an hour in the morning and an hour in the late afternoon and, and handle email that way. Or, or maybe part of your system is going to be, you know what, uh, I'm not going to check email on weekends. Or maybe part of your system is I'm going to have somebody else take a, a, a first glance at my inbox and only send over to me the stuff that really needs my attention and stuff that I specifically have to deal with. And so everybody's system is going to be a little bit different, but I really encourage you to develop a system because if we don't develop an email system, then what happens? We deal with email every hour of every day and it can get in the way of uh, time that we might need to, to dial in on things and focus on things and give projects uh, all of our attention. There's one thing uh, that I did a while ago that uh, uh, has really been significant for me, and it's so simple. I simply turned off my email auto alerts. And so for me now, I don't get that, uh, that little uh, ding uh, when an email comes in, uh, I don't get the uh, bottom right pop up uh, that right helps me just glance at that email a little bit. And so uh, I'm not distracted by that anymore. And so now I can dial in on some projects, some activities, things I want to do. And then I can decide when I want to look at my inbox. And then I go in, open my inbox and, and I see what's there. So uh, that's just a, a, a part of my system and something that's, uh, that's been working pretty well for me. Next, once we have systems in place, again, connected with helping us to work more efficiently, we need to trust our systems, including systems for email, and we need to learn to unplug. So I want to give you this example of, of you maybe violating a part of your system that, uh, that you put in place. So let's say as a part of your system, you are saying, I am not going to deal with emails over the weekend. I am going to completely unplug. But you violate that a little bit because one Saturday morning, you just decide, you know what? I'm just going to do a quick inbox scan and see if there's anything there that, that I need to know about. And sure enough, you, you see something there, uh, right? And so here's my question. Is your weekend really free if you find a crisis in the inbox Saturday morning that you can't address until Monday morning anyway? 
I would argue that your weekend's not really free because that's going to tend to occupy mental space for you. And you're going to spend time thinking about that, right? So think about your systems. And, and again, uh, uh, the right ones for you, uh, the ones that you can trust and that are going to help you overall balance work and life. Tim Ferriss also says this. Uh, he believes that most disasters, quote unquote, that we might find in our inbox can be fixed in 15 minutes or less, right? So one of our challenges with this is we go, I, 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 I better check email, I better check email, I better check email, there might be a crisis, there might be something that needs my attention. And, and Ferris says, in his experience, when I go longer periods of time without checking email and I come back and I find stuff that needs to be dealt with, almost all the time that stuff can be dealt with or fixed in 15 minutes or less. And then a uh, really, really uh, interesting concept here. So you can Google this uh, uh, for yourselves. Uh, uh, French law has recently made it illegal for corporations to expect their employees to be responsive to email over the weekends. <laughs> Did you hear that? It, it, it's literally illegal to do weekend email now over in France. So, so think about that, right? A system that, uh, uh, that they've put in place. And also, there's this uh, really cool experiment that's going on across the country right now with some, some major corporations. And what they're doing is they're experimenting with a four-day work week instead of a five-day work week. But listen to this. Uh, the, the four days are not four 10-hour days. They're still four eight-hour days. And so what these corporations believe is that individuals are going to get the same amount of work done in 32 hours that they would take normally uh, to get done in 40 hours because they're going to limit time and force the important and force focus. And people are going to be more dialed in. And they also believe that uh, uh, people are going to stay dialed in because they're going to be excited about having that extra day off a week. So, so they don't believe that productivity is going to go down at all. A uh, really interesting experiment that's going on out there that you, can, that you can read more about. Here is an email that uh, I received from a ministry leader a while back as, uh, as part of their system. Uh, hello, I will be on sabbatical for 10 weeks. If this is urgent, you can email my uh, board member and assistant, John, and then listen to this, everybody. Otherwise, please reach out again after we're back 10 weeks from now, as all emails received before then will not be read and will be discarded, <laughs> right? So what was this ministry leader implementing? They were saying, look, as part of the system that we're putting together, we're going away on a 10-week sabbatical. And when we come back, we, we don't want to be inundated with email right away. We want to put some guardrails in place. So if this is something that you really need to connect with us on, we're going to ask you to resend an email uh, after this date or reach back out. When we're, when we're back in town. Really, really interesting. And again, I received this from this leader and I thought, man, good for them. And then uh, here is a, a text or a conversation or something that I said to uh, my colleague Heather at Venture One Nine before I was going out of town last summer. Uh, Heather, if the sky is falling, just text me before it hits the ground. Uh, other than that, I'll, I'll see you next week because I am uh, unplugging and uh, I don't want to deal with any work stuff. Author Michael Hyatt uh, divides his week into what he calls front stage time, backstage time, and off stage time. I'm not going to take the time to, to read this quote, but 
Again, a really interesting concept there from Michael Hyatt. And then Gandhi said this, there is more to life than increasing its speed. And somebody out there once said, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. And I completely agree with that. Now, as Christian leaders, we need to balance all of this out with uh, the leading of the Holy Spirit and how God wants us to spend our time day in and day out. And so I wrote myself uh, this note on my office marker board a while ago, and this is just a, a screenshot of it, and I'll read it to you. It simply says this, unless God gave me my schedule today, my schedule, if held too tightly, could actually keep me from doing what God wants me to do. So I understand that we need to be organized and we need to handle our schedules well, and we need to plan those things out. But we also have to submit all of that to God's leading and God's direction, uh, place our lives and our ministries and our day-to-day -day schedules in his hand, and of course, always stay open to his leading in what he wants us to do, again, day in and day out. A few questions to consider here. What is one change I need to make to be more in line with the way of Jesus, the unhurried way of Jesus? Next, what is one new system I need to put in place so I can work more efficiently? And, uh, uh, and how about this one? If I could work only two hours a day, what would I do to keep our organization going strong? What would be those three or four things that I would say these are the most important things to focus on? All right, next. Courageous leaders pursue their first order calling. First order calling is a concept from Dr. Ted Wiesty, who leads the Spiritual Formation Society of Arizona. And this concept is based on Luke chapter 10, which says this. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. I think we can plug our own names in there, right? <laughs> Jonathan, Jonathan, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but only one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. And, and my question here is, what is Jesus saying is the one necessary thing? And it's, it's interesting for me, right? Uh, uh, based on where we started today, Jesus isn't saying that 15 to 20 things are necessary each day. He's saying one thing is necessary. And this is our first order calling. What's necessary is that we have a meaningful connection and that we have intimacy with Jesus. And as we do that, everything else should flow from that place. But there are struggles connected with this, and I'll just go through four of them right here. First, if we're not careful, we find our identity uh, not in Jesus, but in the 15 or 20 things that we try to get done each day. Uh, we find our value and our worth from, from those things. Uh, another struggle is we sometimes see our ministry and our relationship with the Lord as the same thing, and they are certainly not the same thing. And then Dr. Wiesty uh, says here that uh, another part of the struggle is we don't regularly engage in something that he calls examine. And examine is just defined as a prayerful reflection to detect God's presence and discern his 
direction. Uh, Dr. Wiesti says we don't, we don't spend time doing that because again, oftentimes we're just going Mach 5 with our hair on fire. And then uh, to, to summarize uh, all of these points, right? We don't regularly return to a place of, of resting in our first order home. Uh, surrender to God and having that intimacy with Jesus. Priest Luke Didowig says this, Jesus faced an endless supply of need and an overwhelming schedule. Jesus got weary, not simply by the work, but also the human inner challenges. He knew that at dawn or before, people would gather with requests. The to-do list would sprout. Jesus knew the pain and questions of his own heart would be present. So Jesus stopped and went away to pray. Right? So Jesus understood this concept of, of uh, dialing in on that intimacy with the Father, uh, trying to discern what God wanted for him each and every day, getting his marching orders from the Father, and then going out and, uh, and executing that. A couple questions to consider here. Which one of the four struggles that I just mentioned do you most associate with? And what is one step toward improvement there? All right, next. Courageous leaders know that the plan as planned is dubious. We are all working on plans and programs and strategic planning and all that kind of stuff. But the plan as planned is dubious. Let me give you some other words for dubious. Shaky, uncertain, questionable, iffy, <laughs> right? Uh, listen to Simon Sinek talk a little bit about this concept connected with planning. What have you learned about planning from the military? One of the things that I think is very interesting, the difference between at least the Air Force and um, uh, and the military at large and uh, private sector is um, planning, quote unquote, is something that happens in in businesses either once a year, you know, it's sort of your annual strategic whatever, uh, or when something goes wrong, right? We have to have planning sessions, mm -hmm. and that's pretty much the only time there's planning, right? In reaction to something or this prescribed annual event. Uh, in the military uh, and, and in the Air Force, they're constantly, constantly, constantly planning. And they will produce thousands of plans a year, of which only maybe a few hundred will get implemented. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Dwight Eisenhower said a long time ago, and I never understood what he meant until recently, when he said, um, planning is everything, the plan is nothing. And basically what that means is the plan is irrelevant the minute you try to implement it, because your competition, your enemy, whoever it is, they're not following your plan, you know? And your plan will go wrong almost as soon as it's implemented. Right. Um, and it's this constant process of planning that it's not the plan per se, but it's the process of planning that if something does go wrong, you can react to it. One of the interesting practical applications for this was the housing crisis, the economic crisis, which was the actuaries had figured out um, that there was a 99% chance of success for this you know, mortgage-backed security thing. And they thought, oh my God, we're all going to get rich. Let's do this thing. And they did. And it, we all know exactly what happened. The problem is there was no plan for that 1% that happened, which is the housing market collapsed. There was no plan ever developed or thought about if the 1% were to happen. In the military, I can promise you they would have thought about that opportunity. If that, uh, what would ha what, how would we react if that happens? Um, and panic is what ensued. And nobody knew the answer. And things collapsed, and banks collapsed, and people lost money because there was no plan. And now the planning began, and we're still digging ourselves out of the hole, only because planning was an event and not a process. Oh, very, very interesting. So what Simon Sinek is really saying there is the plan as planned isn't going to go exactly as planned, and great leaders plan for that. So, so right? We always plan believing that our plans are going to go exactly as we desire them to go. But newsflash, everybody, they never do. <laughs> and, and we typically never plan for that. Even if we believe that our plans are going to be 99% successful, 
Simon Sinek here is saying, we better think about and we better plan for that 1%. I was at a cookout a while back and I was talking to a real live rocket scientist. Her name was Kathy. And I said, Kathy, tell me a little bit about what you do day in and day out and, and uh, just how that plays out for you. You know, I don't know much about being a rocket scientist. And she said, well, right now specifically, uh, my team is working with uh, NASA on a project that's going to be launched into space uh, a number of months from now. It's a really exciting project. And, and then she said this. She said, my team's job is to think about the two main things that will go wrong and create solutions for those. And until we have those solutions, we're not able to put this project out in space, right? I, I, I love that because they're saying, look, uh, 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 there could be problems with this. Maybe there will be, maybe there won't be. They're not, they're not saying that. They're saying, we're gonna launch this thing and there probably are, right, going to be issues. And we're not gonna launch this thing. We're not gonna put this thing out in space until we've identified what we believe those issues, challenges, problems are going to be, and until we have ways to address them. And so I, I, I love this, this concept, and I think as leaders, we need to, to think more in this way. Here are some quotes that I've heard connected with, uh, with planning. Plans don't often survive first contact. <laughs> Plan A is really only option A. And then how about this one? Everyone has a plan until they get hit in the face. Let me tell you the context of this. Uh, boxer Mike Tyson uh, said this and a, a reporter put a microphone in front of his face and said, hey, Mike, you've got an upcoming fight. And I was interviewing your opponent and they're really feeling good about fighting you. They feel like they've got the, the way to beat you and they got a plan all figured out and their strategy and all that kind of stuff. What do you think of that? And Mike Tyson simply said, everyone has a plan until they get hit in the face. And, uh, uh, and so I, I, really, I really want you to, to see this visual. On the, on the right here is Mike Tyson. And guess what's here on the left? On the left is your plan, <laughs> right? Stuff's going to get, stuff's, stuff's going to get out of whack. You're going to take some hits. And so have you thought about what those might be? And have you thought about uh, uh, the, the new direction you might need to go or the way that you might need to problem solve in the midst of implementing that plan? And so uh, what does this mean for ministry? Uh, what does this mean maybe for a strategic plan that you're rolling out for your organization or for a specific uh, initiative or, or for a specific program? What is the potential 1% and have you thought about that and are you planning for that? I love this from uh, John Ortberg. When in the Bible does God ever give anybody an easy job? When does God ever call somebody, set before them an open door and say to them, this won't inconvenience you much at all. You can polish this task off in a couple of minutes. I don't really want it to be a, a burden on you. And Ortberg says, never. God never says that. Uh, God never says it will be easy. What he does say is what it says in Joshua 1.9. God says, I will be with you wherever you go. And so I, I bring this up to say, as we roll out even God-inspired plans, it's not going to be easy. We're going to uh, run into challenges and hardship and, and hurdles, and we need to think about what those might be, and we need to think about how we might overcome those things when, in fact, they happen. A couple of questions to consider here. How does my Enneagram number affect the way I plan? If you know what your Enneagram number is and the nuances of, uh, of your, uh, your personality style and even how that impacts your planning style. Um, uh, what does that mean for you? And, and, and how can you uh, work with that and also maybe work around some of the challenges? 
And then again, this question again, what 1% should you be planning for right now as you look at different programs and initiatives that you're rolling out connected with your, your nonprofit work? Next, courageous leaders build healthy teams. You cannot grow and build a healthy team unless you know your people intimately. And I just want to give you an exercise, very uh, uh, logistical here, something that you can put into practice right away. It's an exercise that you can work through with your, with your board, with your staff team, with key volunteers, with anybody that you work with that will help you get to know your people a lot more, and it will help you understand their journey quite a bit more. Uh, it comes from a book called uh, Improv Leadership, that's I-M-P-R-O-V, and this exercise is called Story Mining with a Six-Sketch Storyboard. So what you do is you uh, get your people together, or you can even do this one-on-one -on -one with some different folks, and you ask the one main question, what moments or experiences from the course of your entire life have made you the person that you are today. And they are only allowed to pick six moments and then they sketch those out on their storyboard, their sheet of paper, uh, wherever they wanna do that. And then what you do is you take time listening to people explain these six different experiences in their lives. Uh, what were they? Uh, how did they impact them? How did, how did God show up or how did God use these to help uh, shape and form these individuals? Uh, I'm an adjunct professor at a, uh, a Christian university called Johnson University. And so I'm teaching some students who are studying for ministry. And I actually assigned this exercise as a project this past semester. I sent them away to, to do the six sketch storyboard with some people that they work with. And then I had them come back and report on that. And the stuff that they came back and reported was just incredible. Uh, saying things like, uh, I thought I knew <laughs> the people that I was working with, but I found out uh, that I really, I really didn't know them. And now I understand their journey. I understand the experiences, some of the good experiences, some of the traumatic experiences. Um, it's going to help me relate better to them. It's going to help me lead them more effectively. It's going to help me know how to pray for them uh, uh, in a greater way. And so uh, really just encourage you to think about uh, 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 engaging this exercise with some of your key people. Maybe you tell people uh, your board, I'll use as an example. Maybe you say to each board member, I want you to do this. And then at the beginning of each board meeting for the next, you know, six months, you know, if you're meeting maybe once a month, you have one board member come in and share their six sketch storyboard. And everybody learns more about that board member and uh, people will ask more questions and you'll have great dialogue about it. You could close that time down by, by praying for that board member and for the board as a team and different things like that. But um, this will be extremely meaningful for you um, uh, because I'm seeing it be extremely meaningful uh, for the people who are out there doing it. So know your people, and this is one way you can get to know them in, in an intimate way. Next, uh, if you want to build a healthy team, uh, you need to put your people in the right spots and you need to turn them loose. Tim Ferriss says this, it's amazing how someone's IQ seems to double as soon as you give them responsibility and indicate that you trust them. As soon as you say uh, to them, listen, um, uh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this in your hands. I want you to deal with this. I want you to solve this problem, and I'm going to trust the plan that you put together. He says that tends to... Uh, 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 double a person's thought process, double their IQ and make them uh, really dial in and focus and figure things out. And then he said this, and he's at a, uh, an organization where he leads hundreds of people. Ferris said this, I am not a toll booth through which anything needs to pass 
I am more like a police officer on the side of the road who can step in if need be. And then one of my all time favorite quotes from Steve Jobs, we don't hire ridiculously smart people and tell them what to do. We hire them so they can tell us what to do. Love that. Now, when it comes to evaluating staff, or maybe you are running into some challenges connected with some specific team members. This is a concept we have to understand and embrace. We need to recognize the difference between a bump in the road when we are leading and managing a person. We need to recognize the difference between a bump in the road and a bumpy road, <laughs> right? A bump in the road is just that, maybe a one-time thing that comes up every once in a while. Uh, uh, maybe this person created a situation, but this isn't the norm, it's not what they do. Uh, or maybe they've created some challenges or, or maybe they handled an interaction poorly, uh, or maybe they sort of blew a project or a task, right? Uh, was that just a bump in the road? Or, or are we on a bumpy road with this person? Is this more the norm for this individual? Are they always creating challenges? Are there always uh, tricky interactions? Are they always dropping the ball uh, connected with a project? So, so these are two different situations and scenarios and we need to understand the difference here as we're dealing with individual team members and, and as we're evaluating staff. Some other questions to consider connected with this concept. Do I have to manage or motivate this person? Uh, a lot of people, right, of course, need to be managed. But if you're constantly finding yourself having to motivate somebody to get out there and get stuff done, right, that's, uh, again, that's, a, that's a, a whole different situation. How about this? Would I cry if this person quit? <laughs> I love the simplicity. Of, of, of this question right here, would I cry if they, if they went away? How about this, would I hire this person again? Would I want 100 of this person on my, on my team and connected with our work? How about this, if there is a performance issue, is it a skill issue or is it a will issue, right? A lot of, a lot of situations where staff members and team members maybe lack the skill to get something done, uh, that can be taught, right? That can be figured out. That can be uh, sort of released in them. But, but if you're finding that somebody has a will issue, again, right, uh, uh, just not willing to go out and work hard and get things done, uh, again, that's a, that's a different situation. And so overall, we need to understand uh, uh, have we uh, hit a bump in the road maybe with somebody or are we on a bumpy road and does something need to change here? A couple questions to consider. The date I will do story mining with my staff or my volunteers or my team or my board is when? And then how can I become more intentional with relinquishing control and trusting and empowering my staff? Next, courageous leaders are good decision makers. So here's what happens, and I'll just call it an event. An event happens. Something catches us off guard. It surprises us. Uh, uh, maybe something went south, uh, specifically connected with a project or with an individual person. And what happens is when something unexpected like this goes down, it registers immediately, and this is normal, it registers immediately in the emotional part of our brain, which is the back part of our brain, the back part of our head, which makes total sense to me. Because oftentimes when an unexpected event happens, it feels like we're just getting hit in the back of the head, right? Uh, so, so the event happens, it registers in the emotional part of the brain, but now what we need to do is we need to move this experience over to the logical part of the brain because it's there where we're going to be able to balance it out with facts and then we're going to figure out how to respond to it 
more effectively. So our job or one of our jobs in these situations is to figure out how to move this event over from the emotional part of the brain to the logical part of the brain. And so, of course, the next natural question is, Jonathan, well, how do we do that? Well, I, I want to offer uh, just a couple quick uh, uh, starter points here. First, we've, we've got to give things time. Uh, when we tend to react and respond to things right away, uh, we're tending to respond to those things out of the emotional part of our brain. And we all know that when we simply react in an emotional way, that's not always the best thing and can even make a situation worse. So we've got to give it some time. But, but I would say this, as we're giving it time, we, we need to make sure that we are becoming James 1-5 leaders. It says what? If we lack wisdom, which we're going to lack wisdom constantly in leadership situations. If we lack wisdom, we are to put that before God. We're to seek God's direction and discern his purpose. He will grant us wisdom as the, the scripture talks about, and then we'll be able to think through things a little bit more and more appropriately respond in the way that God wants us to respond. And then also, as we're taking this time, we need to consult with others. Hopefully, we all have people who are sort of a, a part of our trusted inner circle. And so this is when we go to them and we say, here's the situation. Here's the event. I'm thinking about it and processing it this way, but I want to run it by you and get your insight and your input. Am I thinking about this correctly? Uh, what would you do in a situation like this? And, and uh, can you give me a little uh, wisdom here and a little direction? So we seek God and we seek the opinion of people who we trust, who are part of our inner circle. John Wartberg said this, wise people never make important decisions in a wrong emotional state. So again, we've got to work to move things from the emotional part of the brain over to the logical part of the brain. And we do that through taking time, trying to gain uh, God's wisdom and God's direction and talking to people who we trust. A couple questions here on a scale of one to 10. How confident am I in my decision making? How can I improve this number? And then do I mainly make my own decisions or am I a James 1-5 leader? Next, courageous leaders lead in different ways at different times. I don't know if you've thought much about this concept, but every organization has a life cycle. And you can see an illustration of that here. There's a start phase, a, a growth phase, and then hopefully a maturity uh, phase. And when we reach the phase of maturity, you can see here at the top of this diagram, this is where you arrive and you enter a steady state. But then at a point, value begins to diminish uh, right with the work that you're doing. And then at the bottom of this diagram, at this point, you need a, a new dream. You need to, to, to reinvent the future a little bit so that you can continue to thrive in the future. So we reach that state of maturity, and, and I'll simplify this even more. At, at this point, we have uh, really two ways we can go. We can redream as a, a, as a leadership team and, and as an organization. And as we redream and sort of reinvent the future and figure out what that next chapter is that, that, that God wants us to pursue, if we do that well, then we'll continue to grow. We'll continue to move up to the right here on this graph and, uh, and we'll continue to be effective and, and make meaningful impact in everything that God's called us to do. But if we fail to redream or we refuse to redream at this point, then instead of going up and to the right, we go down to the right. 
And, and you can see these other stages, right? There's a decline stage. There is even a death stage, right, of an organization. And you say, Jonathan, do some organizations actually die? Uh, absolutely, right? I mean, when's the last time that you've run into a pastor or a nonprofit leader who has said, our organization or our church has been around for 150 years, <laughs> Right, we, we, we typically don't find that. So a lot of organizations start, but they, they, they don't make it over the long haul. And I think a big part of that is because once they reach the maturity stage and phase, um, they rest in that, even though their impact begins to diminish and they're not willing to redream and reinvent themselves. So, which life cycle stage is your nonprofit currently in right now? And then how do I need to lead differently? <coughs> Excuse me. How do I need to lead differently in this stage than in past stages? Right? Think about it. Uh, in the launch stage, that requires a different kind of leadership than in the growth stage and in the maturity stage and in the redream stage. So how do I need to lead differently uh, in the stage that we are currently in as a nonprofit than in past stages? And then this, what are the right next steps to beginning a time of redreaming for our organization? Next, courageous leaders accept their role as CRR. And CRR stands for Chief Resource Razor. We are all in the business of, uh, of, of raising funds for our nonprofit work, and we absolutely need to do that. And, and I believe as one of the main chief resource raisers for your nonprofit, you should have a certain mindset. First, I believe your default position should be that people want to give. And if we connect with people and we provide the right opportunities at the right time for them, then I believe people want to step up and they want to give and they want to help our Christian nonprofits move forward and they want to make kingdom impact with their giving. I really believe this is the default of individuals out there. Now, if you go the other direction and think, no, I think the default is that people don't want to give. Well, then what that tends to to force is we then think about, oh, I've got to try to figure out a way to maybe coerce people to give or guilt them into giving or maybe, you know, manipulate them a little bit um, so that they'll feel like they, they should give, right? So, so believing that people don't want to give sort of sends us off in a different direction, uh, direction in my opinion, that, that, uh, that we don't want to go. Next, we should believe that the resource challenge, the challenge of raising funds, absolutely grows us spiritually as leaders and helps to mature our organization, right? This, this challenge will force us to be even more dependent on the Lord. Uh, this challenge will force us to go to God, to develop plans and strategies and figure out how to more meaningfully uh, connect with people. It will stretch us. It will grow us. It will, it will force us to trust in God more. And I believe all of that is a great, great thing. Also, we need to believe that, that people actually need to know the needs connected with our nonprofit work. It's the very rare person who will find our organizations and believe, you know what, I should give them some, some resources, I should give them some money. Uh, and then that person goes and researches it on their own and figures out what they need and figures out what gift to make and all that kind of stuff. That very rarely happens. So again, we need to be willing to connect with people in a meaningful way, uh, make clear the vision of our organization, what it's going to take to achieve that vision, the needs connected with that, and the financial resources connected with that. And then we communicate all of that clearly and give people an opportunity to, to partner with us. And then, of course, we need to know that the arch enemy of fundraising is complexity. We need to strip everything down and make it very simple 
to understand. A couple other quick things here. CRRs also recognize that their team uh, needs to have the right tools to do their jobs well. So, so think about your team uh, and, and what they need to excel in their positions. Do they have everything they need? Are they encouraged? Are they empowered? Do they have the right tools? Uh, uh, do they have what they need day in and day out to get their jobs done well? Uh, we need to make sure that that's happening. And then also as CRRs, we need to, to think about what it means to resource the souls of our team members. Asking the question, how can I value, honor, and bless the people that God has, has brought our way and who are a part of our team right now? People work hard. People put it on the line. Uh, are we valuing them for that? Are we honoring them for that? And are we making sure that they know that they're valued and honored? And are we looking for ways to bless them and encourage them further? A couple of questions here. Do I see myself as the CRR for our organization? If so, how should that factor into my weekly schedule? I love that question. And then what are some things I can do to bless team members during a demanding season of ministry? Okay, everybody, courageous leaders. We've talked about these seven concepts. Know how to change their number, pursue their first order calling. They know that the plan is dubious and think about the planning for that 1%. They build healthy teams. They're good decision makers. They lead in different ways at different times and they accept the role as chief resource raiser. I have a big question mark here because my, my, uh, my question here for you is what one concept here uh, or, or two concepts here do you maybe need to focus on moving forward? I'm not saying that you have to have all seven of these figured out, you know, by next Wednesday and, and uh, be experts in all these areas. That's not going to happen. But, but uh, simply put, what has God said to you uh, during this time? What are some areas that have stood out for you? And, and maybe what are some areas, again, that need uh, improvement or that you need to, uh, uh, to focus on moving forward? All right, as I wrap up our time together, and then we'll open it up for a little discussion, I want to share this, uh, uh, this metaphor for you. You're taken hostage by somebody, okay? And uh, they're asking you to, to give up the goods, give up all the secrets, but you're tough. You're not going to do that. And so this, uh, this person says, okay, then I'm, I'm going to have to cut off one of your fingers but uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a nice captor. And so I'm gonna give you the choice, which finger uh, are you willing to part with? Uh, if we were all in that situation, do you, know, do you know which finger you might be willing to give up? Uh, think about it for just a second. What, what finger do you feel like you can do without? Okay. Um, and so now if you're thinking about that, I'm going to tell you which finger you should give up and what that has to do with leadership right now, okay? So you're intrigued, right? So first, you would never, ever give up your pinky, right? I, I got some of you already, right? You were thinking the pinky. The, the pinky represents actually 50% of the strength in your entire hand. Next, you would never give up your ring finger or your middle finger. They are connected uh, by one tendon and together they represent 35% of the strength of your hand. And of course, we all know under no circumstances would you ever give up the thumb, right? The thumb is the most important digit on your, on your hand. And so what does that leave? It, it leaves the pointer finger. So this is so interesting to me. This is the number one finger we can do without. And this is also the number one finger that we most connect with leadership, right? You go and do that. We're going this direction. Our organization's awesome. I'm the leader. You follow me, right? So we most connect this with leadership 
but it's the finger that we can most do without. So I want you to think about that concept. Now, uh, uh, I just said that the thumb is the most important digit, right? How does that connect with leadership? Well, check this out. The thumb is the only finger that can work with every other finger. Look at this. It's the only one that can do that. It's the finger that sort of brings everything else together. And even when we make a fist, right, it's the thumb that, that sort of holds it all together and offers that strength and, and that protection. And so the thumb is, is really most connected with leadership. And so I want you to think about this concept moving forward, uh, right? What does it mean to be more of a thumb instead of more of a pointer finger when it comes to all that God has called us to do and when it comes to leading our teams effectively and helping our organizations get to the next level.